From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny Don Taylor. Are you here in L.A.? With Mrs. McLean. Why didn't you meet my plane? Dr. McLean's been shot. What? Teresa Corbett's boyfriend, a guy named Riley, pumped three slugs in him this afternoon. He was afraid McLean might get off. McLean's still alive? He's hanging on, but they don't give him much of a chance. I'm on my way to the hospital right now, L.A. General. Meet you there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. Expense account item 13, $10, rental, for a tape recording machine, which I took with me to the hospital room of Dave McLean. Don Taylor met me in the hall. Hi. Hi. Where's Mrs. McLean? I turned her over to the police. You know about this? No. Who's this man, Riley? Oh, just a lonely guy who lost his girlfriend. Let's go. Wait a minute. There's something else, isn't there, Johnny? Oh, I don't know. I think there is, Don. I'm going to try to get it from McLean now. That's why I brought this thing. What'll happen to Riley? He's being held for assault with a deadly weapon intent to kill. If McLean dies, it'll be changed to murder. Mr. Dollar? Yes? You can go in now. This is Mr. Taylor. I'd like him to come in, too. It's all right. This way, please. The nurse led us down to the end of the hallway and into McLean's room. Transfusion equipment was rigged up on one side of him and intravenous on the other. He watched us walk in without a word until he saw me set up the recording equipment. What do you think that's for? You, McLean. That statement we were talking about. What statement? You know how bad off you are. It doesn't make any difference now. (laughs) Who's this man? My name's Taylor. Police. I'm with Tri-State Underwriters. Oh. (laughs) You must be a close friend of Doris. She came out here with him, McLean. How is Doris these days? She's made her statement. <laughs> Squeeze play. How about you? No. I'm not going to say a thing. Oh, now, McLean. T- tell you what I'll do. We'll talk about it later. There may not be a later. I think there will be. <coughs> I'm going to bet on it that way. It's tough, Della. You struck out again. There's always your wife. She won't tell you anymore. She's got her own troubles. <coughs> I think you'd better leave now, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. McLean's chances for recovery were one in ten. That isn't very good odds. But as he said, he was going to bet on himself. And he won. Three days later, he took a turn for the better. Within a week, he was walking around the hospital. The trial date was set for him to answer charges of defrauding an insurance company. Mrs. McLean was named co-defendant. All set. When do you take off, Don? About five minutes. Good night for flying. Yeah. Now, what's the matter, Johnny? Oh, I don't know. This whole case, the people in it, I, I just don't know. You ought to be satisfied. You've certainly done your job. McLean's are going to stand trial, and there's no doubt they'll be convicted. You testify in court, and that's about it. I know. Don... Yeah? There's more to it. Why? I know there is. There has to be. McLean's slick enough not to open his mouth. He hasn't admitted anything. His wife's done all the talking. Sure, that's true. But what she said was enough for us. Was it? Well, wasn't it? Not for me, Don. Johnny, what is it? (sighs) Riley, I suppose, and that poor girl, Teresa Corbett. A couple of little people walked into it. Riley's suffering worse than the McLean's. Then they'll suffer. He lost somebody he loved. She died naturally. He would have lost her sooner or later. McLean's had nothing to do with that. Didn't they? No. Well, I've been thinking about it. Just go in and testify in court and come home and try to forget about it, will you? Maybe you're right. Flight 913, Chicago, New York, and well, Boston now boarding. See you in a few eight. days, Johnny. Okay. Bye. One thing, Don. Yeah? Suppose go Teresa Corbett had been my girl. So long, kid. <laughs> Don Taylor went back to Hartford and left me to wrap up the details and testify in court. 
The day before the trial, I went over to the county jail to interview Mrs. McLean just once more. Hello. Hello. The uniform isn't too attractive, but they say it's a very healthy life in here. I mean, the regular hours and all. I suppose I should try to get used to it. Yeah. How, how long will I have to go to prison? Well, that's hard to say exactly, Mrs. McLean. Well, my lawyer said not over three years if they convict us. Three years isn't too long. No. Sit down. Where's my husband? Uh, where's Dave? He was transferred to the county jail today. Is he all right? Seems to be getting along fine. I haven't seen him, you know. You'll see him in court. Oh, I wish it were all over. So do I. But it isn't, is it? Practically. Not at all. Well, what do you mean? So far, we have enough evidence to prove conspiracy against you and your husband, and we'll prosecute to the limit on that. There'll be some other charges against him, the business with the body and so on. Let's not go into that now. But there's something else here I want to get straightened out. This is your statement. Yes. Let me read you this. A girl, whom we later found out to be Teresa Corbett, walked into the office on the night of February 1st, 1954, and complained of feeling ill. She had been drinking. My husband took her into the examining room where she died a few minutes later of a heart condition. Those are your own words on this sworn statement, Mrs. McLean. Yes. Let me go on. I had never seen or heard of Teresa Corbett until that night. I was with my husband when he placed a call to her residence in Jersey City. He spoke with a man there who managed an apartment house and so on. Mrs. McLean, that call was never made. I was in the room when Dave made it. The phone company has no record of it, no bill for it. I mention this to you because we are going to mention it at the trial tomorrow. You have my statement. Are you trying to make a liar out of me? The fact remains that call wasn't made. Were you in the examining room when Teresa Corbett died? No, I was in the front office. Isn't it a fact that she was a patient of your husband's before that night? No. I found out, I'll tell you. Teresa Corbett was one of your husband's patients. Why, she... She came here to live in Los Angeles because of a heart condition she had. He was the doctor she went to see. She just didn't walk in that night and drop dead. If that's true, I didn't know it. That night you said you were acting as a receptionist in your husband's office. When Teresa Corbett walked in, she must have given you her name when she asked to see the doctor. Well, she didn't. Frankly, I, I thought she was just a little drunk. She, she'd been drinking. I, I could smell it. And you just took her right on back to your husband without asking a name, where she lived, anything about her? Yes. Now, look, Mrs. McLean, a lot of things you've told me and put into this statement are true. They've all been checked and rechecked. That's my job. But some of them just don't make sense. What are you trying to do? You wouldn't have known anything about it if I hadn't come to the insurance company. Maybe that's so. Maybe it would have just gotten by. But you did come to us. And whether you knew it or not, we have to know everything now. Everything, Mrs. McLean. Why do you think we've gone to all the trouble and expense of checking all this? I'll tell you. Because your story was too good to be real. It couldn't happen that way, even though the facts seem to say it could. Why, a girl alone and friendless in Los Angeles, dying of a heart attack in a doctor's office. A doctor who needs money and has a wife who's heavily insured. That's too much for me to take. Teresa Corbett was a patient of your husband. She had been for several months. She came in like anybody else. You or your husband took her personal history... And you noticed that she had only one living relative, a mother in Jersey City. Will you please tell me what you're talking about? I'm talking about premeditated, carefully planned murder. That's what I'm talking about. When Teresa Corbett's mother died suddenly, there was nobody left to worry about her. Nobody to ask questions about her anymore, right? That's what you thought, anyhow. But there was a man, George Riley. But he didn't know where to go or who to ask. You didn't know about him. All right. Teresa came in several times, and you and your husband got to know more about her. She was the patsy right from the beginning. Wasn't she? Wasn't she? Yes. Do you want to tell me about it? She, she had been in to see Dave several times. He knew all about her, where she was from, what family she had. That night, when she came in the office, she wasn't drunk. She hadn't even been drinking. She'd had a telegram. She, she'd just received word that her mother had died suddenly. She was terribly upset about it. She, she asked Dave for something to help her sleep. Go on. Well, he took her in the examination room, and he came out a few minutes later to get some drugs, and, and he said something about her case being a terminal. Terminal? You mean it was hopeless? Well, that's what he said. He said he didn't give her more than six months. It wasn't true, Mr. Dollar. She wasn't that sick. Then what? Well, 
Dave went back to the examination room. I, I just sat there and waited. I guess I knew what he had in mind. Had you talked about it? Well, we talked... Oh, no, not about what happened then. A few minutes later, he, he buzzed me to come back to the room. I went back there, and Teresa was lying on the table. She was dead. Uh-huh. I knew it when I walked in there. Dave looked very strange. He said that she had had a sudden heart attack and died before he could do anything to help her. You know it wasn't so. Well, there was a hypodermic on the stand. He'd given her something. I just didn't think he'd go that far. Are you sure you hadn't discussed this before? Oh, I swear he hadn't said a word to me before that night. But he had it all planned. That is, what to do and everything when I came back to the room. He called Dr. Reed. Dave showed him... Teresa, and said it was me. Reed signed the death certificates? Yes. When did you leave town? The same night. Dave made me. He said he'd handle everything. I accused him of killing her, and, and he said that she just died there. Well, I guess I was kind of hysterical, but, but then he said, all right, I did kill her. She didn't have long anyhow. I killed her, and you helped me kill her. Now get out of here and stay out of here. If you ever open your mouth about it, you'll go to the gas chamber with me. Do you want a cigarette? Yes, please. Here you go. Thanks. I told you that story. I mean, about the phone call and all. To get back at him. I never thought that I'd tell you this part, too. Oh, I'm glad I did. I'm glad it's all over. <laughs> Expense account item 14, $85.40, hotel and board while in Los Angeles. Item 15, $205, plane fare back to Hartford. Expense account total, $798.60. Remarks? Murder charges have been filed against the McLeans, and they stand trial next month. George Riley received three years and a suspended sentence for assault with a deadly weapon. I was wrong about practically everything in this case. All the lies came true, but so did the facts. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, Cui Bono. That's Latin for who benefits. And believe me, it isn't the killer in the case. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lucille Meredith, Betty Lou Gerson, John Stevenson, Bob Bruce, Victor Perrin, Tony Barrett, and Herb Ellis. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>